Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. In case you don't know, this is the Teach birthday party. So if you, if you are in a different room than what you are supposed to be, this is the time to leave. If not, the door will close, and you will be unable to leave this room until the end. <laughs> um, so we are very happy that you guys are here. We are very happy to have the panel. We are very happy to have our global director, Jaime Saavedra, to open the event for us. So let's just go to Jaime. Uh, he will open uh, the event, and then we will have the presentations, and then Dave will moderate the panel. Yeah. Yep. So I can do it from here. So first of all, uh, thank you very much to uh, to everyone uh, for being for being here. Um, I'm extremely glad that we have back at least for a few hours. Uh, Mr. Evans, uh, Dr. Evans, I should say, at least for a few hours, but we'll manage more soon. And, uh, and also to have a great panel here, um, Matthew, Jacobus, um, uh, Royce, and Yanu, um, to, uh, to uh, spend um, um, some minutes discussing one issue that is absolutely crucial, crucial for our work. Uh, everyone here knows we are, as I always say, we're not in we're not in trouble, but we're in deep trouble, right? <laughs> um, in the sense that the challenges that we have on global education are are not large, but are immense, mm -hmm. right? When we when we talk about the our, our last the last indicator that we have been uh, working on, on learning poverty, so that's the percentage of kids who cannot read and understand it by age ten, a text by age ten, and see that half of the kids cannot do it. Right, you say, look, I mean, this is an extremely, extremely complicated uh, challenge that we have. Um, so, and, and we see that, and everyone here will see it in their day-to-day -day work and when they go and visit the countries, that um, the, um, the, the nature and the magnitude, both the nature and the magnitude of the challenge that we have is, is huge, despite the fact that uh, we can recognize, like, look, we know how a good school is run. Right. Um, the problem is that we don't need one good school. We need thousands and dozens of thousands of, of, of good schools. I mean, in a, in, a, in, a, in a country, in a medium-sized country like mine in Peru, mm -hmm. you need not a one good school, you need 50,000 good schools, mm -hmm. right? That in which you have half a million teachers, right? Um, and not necessarily 50,000 principals, right? And unfortunately. Um, uh, and uh, and, we, I, and and the fact that we then have to to work with uh, that half a million teachers in a middle in a middle sized uh, country uh, is basically the proof of the another way of seeing the magnitude of this challenge because we need to make sure that all half a million teachers have a good in a good interaction with their students. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, then we have a good education. Mm -hmm. But it, if that doesn't, then we don't. And so um, uh, when, we, when we define, have been working on what's the, uh, what's the approach, what's the strategy, what are the different elements we need to work on an education system so that they can have a, a good school running, there are many elements on which we need to work. But the most crucial element is the human factor. Right, still in education, uh, despite technology, technology can help a lot to make um, to make humans more effective, more efficient, um, to make the learning process uh, faster, more productive, more entertaining. Yes, but the human factor is still extremely important. So, a good school, you'll see a good school when you have a when you see a good principal, independently on the infrastructure of the inputs, uh, and you see a good classroom when there's a good teacher. Right, actually, that 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 is that is the crux of our of our of our work. And that's the difficult thing because we need anything that we do needs to affect the the work of that teacher and the interaction of that teacher between uh, between that teacher and student. Mm -hmm. If that interaction does not change, all our interventions are at the end of the day uh, a bit irrelevant. So uh, this this work that I mean, now we are we are glad to uh, to um, uh, have one year um, of 
starting the work of teach as one of the tools that we have in order to make the, the work of the teachers uh, more effective is, um, is something that is uh, very, very important uh, for us. It's really one reason to, to celebrate that we have one observation tool that has been already applied in 16 countries, uh, many other countries to come, but it's one tool, one observation tool. There could be others, and there's other things that we still need to do in terms of improving the work of the, uh, of the teachers, but it's an important step, it's a critical step in order to make sure that that performance of that teacher is the right one. So I, I I, I really think that a tools like this one um, that aims at changing the behavior of the teacher are the ones that we should be worried about. We have spent hundreds of millions of dollars during the last two decades, we and the countries in terms of teachers training, in terms of investing in their teachers' pro professional development. But we need, what we need to make sure of every dollar that we spend in terms of training teachers is that that implies a change in their behavior tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's the key thing that we have, that we, that we, that, that we need to, to aim at. And this is one of the, is, this is, this, this work is, is in that, in that direction. So it's critical for all our teams who are supporting government governments, but it's critical to governments in general. Mm -hmm. How can we have interventions that will change the behaviors of the behavior of teachers and will change the performance of teachers tomorrow? And we always say tomorrow, I will say tomorrow because there are kids in school already today. Right? There are a lot of reforms that we have to do in education that are absolutely critical, but that will take time. Right? We need to reform the pedagogical institutes of a country. Of course we need to do that. We do have to change the structure of teacher's career. We need to change the curriculum. Yes, we need to do that. But that will take two, three, four, five years. In in the meantime, in the meantime, there is a kid today in the classroom, mm -hmm. and we need to do something with uh, with him or her. So thank you very much for everyone for being here. I hope we'll have a fantastic discussion, and I turn over to uh, Essay. Thank you very much. And before before that. This clap should be for Ezekiel, Adele, Tracy, and everyone else in the team who has been working uh, intensively during the last years on this task. Uh. OK, let me start. So. Almost a year ago to this day, we gave birth to a 200 gram baby that we call Teach. You know? Today, uh, we are happy as our, you know, as new, as new parents that had no idea how to take care of this baby, we had a big uh, learning curve and we had a lot of a sleepless night. But today, you know, when our beautiful baby turns one, we are very happy to report the top five lessons of, you know, of last year, of having conducted actually 10,000 observations. So in the map, you could see the 16 countries where we already have applied teach, as well as the 15 countries where we're currently applying it. So before I get into the top five lessons, let me do a little recap at, about what teach is for those of you that just joined the conversation or may not know what teach is. So TEACH is a classroom observation tool to measure teaching practices in primary classrooms. It has two main components. Uh, it measures the share of time that the teachers uh, provide learning activities for students, what we call time on task. And a second component measures the quality of teaching practices. This component uh, has, three, okay, this has, one, has uh, three main areas, classroom culture, instruction, and helping uh, students develop their social emotional skills. These three main areas point to nine uh, elements, and these nine elements point to 28 behaviors. These behaviors are scored uh, low, medium, high, based on the evidence collected during the observation, and then translated into a fine point scale that quantify teaching practices. So with that, let's get to the top five. So number five. Is it is possible to reliably apply a high inference tool in low and middle income countries. Before TEACH, and even today, many countries use what we call low inference, 
or checklist uh, to measure teaching practices. So for example, if you want to know whether the teacher is checking for a student understanding, you may have a question like, did the teacher ask question to check for a student understanding, yes or no? We wanted to move away from that and actually provide more details about the quality of the questions uh, uh, and whether those questions were asked to most students and not just you know, one student that is raising their hand. So this is an example of one behavior of the 28 behaviors in teach. Uh, but as you see, one potential problem that comes with this is do we have the observers to apply this reliably? So what do we mean by when we say reliably? We mean that if we have two observers watching the same classroom, do they assign similar scores or not? And if they don't assign similar scores, then having a standardized tool has no value. So what have we found after one year, 16 countries, over 500 uh, observers trained? What we find is more than 90% of observers that go through our training pass the certification exam. So this certification exam is uh, th so these three videos that they watch and they assign the scores. And then we compare those with the scores that are assigned by expert teach observers. Uh, and if they are similar enough, they pass. Uh, but that is you know, just an exam that we do after the training. So what about what's happening in the field? You know, what we find is that looking at the data from the field is that only 4% of the variation in the scores is due to observer's effects. Uh, that again, in the literature of classroom observation tool, this is a very good uh, finding. So let's go to the lesson number four. Time spent teaching is very different than teaching quality. So once the teacher is in the classroom, once the teacher is in the school, and we can actually apply the tool, uh, we find that most teachers spend most of the time on task. Actually, we find that that is more than 80% of the time in the classrooms that we visit. However, what we also find is that the quality of the student-teacher interactions are very low and actually less than 30% of the teachers score three or above three in the teacher score that has five uh, points. So lesson number three. The biggest surprise is the lowest score on traditional instructional practices. What do, what do I mean by this? Uh, what do I mean by the biggest surprise? Let me, let, let me take you to a typical teach country, uh, which will remain unnamed uh, so we don't shame it. So if you see, uh, the first two items are classroom culture, the, from the third to the second row are instruction, and the last ones are social emotional skills. So what you can see, the, the, there are two main findings here. First, teachers score higher on classroom culture than in instruction, and they score higher in instruction than in social emotional skills. This comes as no surprise to us. So why we should expect teachers to score high in social emotional skills when they don't really get any training on this? Uh, and also, if you keep looking, you will see critical thinking also score pretty low. Uh, and again, this is not a surprise. Uh, however, what it is a surprise is the fact that traditional common instructional practice like lesson facilitation, making sure that the objective of the lesson aligns with the activities, checking for a student understanding, making sure that every student is understanding the material, and feedback, actually providing meaningful feedback to students, those are also very low. Well, but in theory, this should be something that pre and in service focus on continuously. Uh, and, and we feel like this is actually the biggest finding, that on those that you can act and you can improve, we are not doing enough. Okay, so the second lesson, number two. Can you compare teacher scores across countries? Uh, you know, Teach was not developed to benchmark uh, teaching quality across countries, that was not the main objective. But given the fact that we already have 16 countries and, you know, and the number keep growing, of course people are going to compare the results. Uh, so the, the point is, can they actually do it? Is that meaningful? Uh, you know, and in this question, people usually have very, very strong views. Uh, you know, it's like, are good teaching practice universal? And then Twitter is like, ah, ah, you know? Like people are shouting, and you have like two groups of people, no? So the first group of people is, T 
teach, good teaching practices are endogenous to countries' culture. So if that is the case, there's nothing you can do. You can't compare something that is endogenous to, to countries' culture. The second group says, you know, the manifestation of good teaching practices, for example, how teachers show respect in China may be very different than how teachers show respect to students in Tanzania. But, but even though the manifestation may be different, the practice the, in both countries, this is a good practice. And if this is a good practice and teach when, they me when we measure the practice, we don't prioritize one strategy over the another, then we, we should be able to compare. So are you curious about the results? Uh, uh, so what we find is that actually, as, you know, neither of these groups is entirely right, as you can imagine, and a more balanced view uh, provides a better sense of what's going on. And as you can see, the ones, the items colored in green are the ones that we find to be invariant. That means that, uh, they pro th that you can use it across countries and compare. Uh, and this is also interesting because these items are the ones that consistently provide the most information on the quality of teaching practices across countries. Uh, and, you know, and if you look at them, uh, again, it's not a big surprise. It's the ones that you would expect uh, to, to provide more information and to be invariant. So what is the lesson number one? Jaime will love this. There is still a lot of work to be done, you know? Uh, we work a lot to raise this child from zero to one, uh, but it's still a lot of work to be done to get this child from one to like, you know, uh, to develop all the human potential that, that, that we can. It, di it did take a village to, to, the, to, to raise this child. Uh, and during this year, we faced several challenges. And we are now trying to, to meet those challenges. So let me tell you three of them uh, that are important. The first one is, you know, we go to a country, we do teach primary, they are happy about it. And they, the second question is, okay, now I want to teach EC. Can I use this for teach EC? Or can I use this for secondary? I mean, it's similar enough, why not? Uh, so then we, you know, we decided like, they are going to use it, this is going to happen. So the best thing that we can do is try to develop the adaptations for Teach EC and Teach Secondary. And we are working with partners and researchers to make sure that we provide a good quality product. Uh, the second one uh, was making sure that the way that Teach data is, uh, the Teach is applied and analyzed, have an inclusive lens, uh, making sure that we focus on all students and not just some, uh, and, and that we reflect those practices in the tool. And we're also working with the, uh, with the team at the bank, uh, as well as with experts outside uh, on, how to, on how to do this. And finally, you know, Teach is free. We always advertise that we're very proud that Teach is free. Uh, but if you want to use Teach, you will need a trainer, you will need some. So, so we, we have developed lots of material. We have, like, they have to collect the data, they have to analyze the data, the terms of reference for this, the roster of experts for that. But you still need uh, some resources. And something that we get all the time is emails from teachers, schools, principals that want to use Teach, want to be trained on Teach. And there is no way that we, I mean, we can refer them to the consultants, but they don't have the money to hire one of them. Uh, so what we are working on as part of our Teach Digital Strategy is to have an online training uh, that, uh, that we can use uh, to, to so people can be trained from anywhere. And in this case, we're also looking for partnerships. So if you have expertise on this, and more importantly, money, uh, just give us a call and we will be happy to, you know, we'll be happy to take it. Uh, so, I, so, so the last one is like, we are also doing much more research, no? We don't think that the tool is final. We don't think, you know, there is a lot more validation to be done. I'm sure we will find a lot of things that need to be improved over, the, over time. And, and that's something that we are hoping to do and keep doing as, as part of this work. So these are the, our takeaways from this year, you know, from this very hard year that, that we had. Uh, 
but we also wanted that in this party, in this celebration of Teach, to you know to hear the voices from the field, to hear the voices of the people actually implementing Teach. Uh, you know, country teams as well as governments, because they are a very, you know, they are a big part of making teach a success uh, and a big part of teach. Uh, so I wanted to give it to Tracy uh, that will tell us more about that. No, down. Thank you, Eze. So we just heard from Eze on what the five main takeaways were from TEACH over the last year. But the data only tells us so much. So the purpose of this segment is to bring those numbers to life. And as part of this, we spoke with our colleagues in Angola and Punjab, Pakistan. We chose these two um, countries because they have the experience of not just piloting the tool, but are either in the process or have already integrated the tool as part of their teacher monitoring system. Um, and so this came without, this didn't come without its challenges. As, as I discussed before, uh, implementing teach in a low income, low capacity setting is more than possible, but it takes a lot of hard work and effort from the country teams and the government counterparts to make this a reality. So let's hear from some of them um, from Punjab and Angola now. One of the key challenges we faced was uh, related to some of the high-end indicators. For example, at times, we've seen that enumerators develop their own interpretations of certain indicators. So it's very important that you keep going back to them, at least in the first few stages, and keep telling them that they need to make sure that they align their understanding with the rubric. And then at the same time, tell them that it's okay if in the beginning you don't understand that because it's, gonna, it's going to be a time-taking process. Uh, and lastly, I would advise everyone to, to train as many days as possible, train the practitioners on as many days as possible on this tool uh, because it's only with time that they'll be able to understand different indicators and how to implement this tool. We often underestimate the challenges in difficult contexts to do a lot of these assessments, to have quality data. Um, I've had experiences in some of these more challenging contexts where we've done an entire assessment and in the, the results, it's clear to see that they're not very reliable. Um, I think teach as a tool uh, is, is simplified, but I think actually applying it is more complex uh, than it may seem at first, especially the people applying the tools, even with the training, um, I think it's not enough. Challenges that we we're will still be facing is that uh, whatever information TEACH is giving is actually utilized in the right way to have the right policies in, in place so that it impacts student learning. I think a lot of work needs to be done to make sure that the feedback loop is there, the, um, the, the tool is being utilized to help teachers understand what they need to do better in classroom, they feel supported, they feel that uh, this tool is not really um, bringing the, any anything bad to them, but rather it's something that will support them in improving how they perform in the classroom. So we know that if it was just challenges, TEACH wouldn't have had and gained the momentum that it did. And part of the reason that there has been a lot of uptake in using the tool is because it gives policymakers and practitioners a view into what's happening inside the classroom. And we know that these teacher-student interactions are crucial to improving teaching practices. So to learn a little bit more about how these insights, um, how these insights made it worth it to overcome the challenges, uh, let's hear again from our colleagues. One of the interesting things that happened using TEACH was that we were working with the government to actually try to see what is happening in the classroom. And with that, we were able to identify areas where teachers were really not performing as they should so that the students learn. And those areas were critical in terms of development for the teacher training, the emphasis on, on certain things that everyone thought that teachers didn't know was actually not 
or in reality what was happening in the classroom. So in that sense, it really helped push the dialogue forward in what the teachers already know and how it needs to be changed. At the modo geral, ela ajudou nos a compreender como é que nós podemos agrupar em grandes temas diferentes perspectivas do trabalho do professor na sala de aula. E também ajudou nos a parametrizar o olhar sobre a supervisão. O que é que nós vamos prestar atenção em cada momento que nós decidimos fazer o trabalho da supervisão? É, primeiro, os nossos professores trabalham no, no isolamento. É, quando alguém entra para a sala de aula, as normas são os inspetores para ver o certo e o errado. É, nós aprendemos com o Tite que não é na perspectiva do que está certo e do que está errado. Mas como é que podemos olhar é, o trabalho do professor como uma atividade de meio para alcançar um objetivo. Então, será que essa atividade está a ser feita da maneira e da dose adequada para alcançar o objetivo? Então, isso foi uma grande lição que nós tivemos com, com o Tite. Eu acho que fazer os clips que são requeridos para treinar os professores permitiu nos chegar em casa e encontrar um pouco mais do que está acontecendo em uma forma de dia a dia. E alguns dos clips foram realmente muito surpreendentes no contexto de Angola e havia muitas similaridades. Eles foram feitos em áreas rurais areas and urban areas and we found things that the teachers are doing in the classroom that would definitely be having a very negative impact on learning outcomes um, and some of those things were not things that uh, at a policy level we were aware of also just the the overall atmosphere in the school which has led to a lot of discussions on how can we improve that as well and train the teachers in a way to how do they interact with them children and things so that was actually a surprising uh, outcome of teach but has really helped us kind of identify what's going on. So by implementing the tool, um, policymakers and practitioners are given additional insights into what's happening in the classroom. But these insights don't necessarily translate into impact. And we find the greatest value in the teach tool is being able to see what's happening in the classroom and to impact that. And we're starting to see the beginnings of this. And we'll now watch our final video, which presents um, the, the impact that teach is having in Angola and Punjab. Teach, it helps us justamente a conferir autoridade ao nosso argumento sobre a supervisão que ele produz, ele demonstra resultados que podem ser analisados e interpretados. Então são evidências dentro do princípio de gestão ou políticas por evidências suficientemente úteis para o debate da implementação e consolidação da supervisão do sistema de educação. What our hope is for TEACH and what I think will need a lot of time is that it also gives teachers and students and families the feeling that, uh, that our support, our programs and, and also the policies are focused on them and not on some abstract bureaucrat that sits far away. It would be interesting to see how this tool can be contextualized to give feedback and mentoring and probably going forward that is something that perhaps we should be looking into if the same tool can be adapted for any other region and how they can use this to improve teaching practices and not just collect data on teaching practices. So now that we have the data to, now that we have collected the data, how do we use it to support teachers? So to learn a little bit more about the work that we're doing in this area, I'd like to invite my colleague Adele up uh, to speak about this. Thank you, Tracy. So before I jump into my slides, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Odemi, who's in the room, who helped put together those videos, and also to JB, um, who's one of our star TEACH trainers, who's here in the room with us today, and has been instrumental in really getting TEACH off the ground. So from observation to support, I'm here to tell you about how we're going to build on the work that we've been doing in TEACH over the past year to go from observing teachers to really supporting them to improve their teaching practices in the classroom. And this is the work program that we call COACH. So what is COACH? In essence, COACH is a program to improve in-service teacher professional development in countries across the world. And 
the main idea is really to go from traditional professional development that tends to be one size fits all, highly theoretical, general, with no follow up for the teachers, to a program that really builds on four key principles that build on the evidence that exists out there of what really works to really change teaching practices in the classroom. These four principles are that in-service teacher training should be tailored, practical, focused, and ongoing. And I'll go into each of these principles in more detail in the following slides so you see what we mean. Now, while we're called coach, and while coaching is really the best way to embody these four principles in in-service teacher training, we know that the realities on the ground might not enable a coaching system to be implemented tomorrow, as Jaime said. And so in this work program, what we're really trying to do is think through the steps that we can help countries take to move towards this ideal. For example, in-service teacher training that is tailored. In systems that we see nowadays, teacher training tends to be the same for all. There's a predetermined curriculum that all teachers receive, regardless of how many years they've been teaching for, what their needs are, what their strengths and weaknesses are. And as a next step to this, we see that data could be used to prioritize skills that are targeted within group training sessions. And this is where a tool like Teach and the data that's generated from a tool like Teach could really come in to help identify what strengths and weaknesses are and then to tailor the support to teachers. And within a coaching system, what this would look like is where a school leader would go into a classroom, observe the teacher, and then provide feedback and support and techniques that the teachers need based on what the school leader has seen in the classroom. The second principle is to get it get teacher training to be practical. And what we see really is that currently teacher training is primarily lecture based. And we know from the adult learning literature that this is not the best way to change behavior. It's not putting people in a room, speaking at them and telling them what they should or shouldn't be doing. What we really want to see is teacher training that incorporates some kind of practice. So for example, as a next step, we could see that in group training, teachers are given the space and the time to really try out the methods that they're being told about. And within a coaching system, it could be where teachers are given this support in a one-to-one -one setting. So again, the school leader observes the teacher, identifies areas where the teacher needs support, and then maybe models a specific technique that the teacher could use and have the teacher try out the technique themselves and provide feedback based on that. That has a much higher chance of changing the teacher's behavior than just telling them about it. Next is to get teacher training to be focused. And what we mean by this is that teacher training currently tends to encompass a wide range of techniques. And this can be very overwhelming to get a lot of information that may, not, that may or may not be applicable to what you need. And it's unlikely to change teacher behavior. And so the next step to this that we see is coming up with group training that is focused on one or two techniques per session. And building on the previous principles that we mentioned, this would ideally be data driven so that again, there's data informing which techniques are chosen, one or two techniques are focused per session, are chosen per session, and then you move on to the next techniques when the teachers have mastered these specific techniques. And finally, within a coaching system, this could look like a school leader focusing on just one or two techniques in a coaching session, again, providing support to that teacher until the teacher has mastered it before moving on to the next set of techniques. And again, from the adult learning literature, we know that this is most likely to affect change in the teacher's behavior in the classroom. Finally, the principle of ongoing support. And here, what we see is that teacher training tends to be a one-off training. In-service teacher training tends to be one-off. So teachers get three days in a year where they're all brought together and given all the potential information that they might need for the coming year. But again, this information that they're receiving is not um, in accordance with their needs. It's not as and when they need it. So as a next step to this, we could see, for example, instead of having three days of training all together, maybe those three days could be spread out throughout the year so that teachers get that continued support so that there is some way, again, of tailoring that support to teachers of monitoring progress and eventually getting to a stage where teachers receive repeated cycles of observation and feedback. And again, this is, that will give us the highest chance of changing teachers' behavior in the classroom. So this is really the coach vision, to go from traditional teacher in-service professional development to one where teachers receive focused, tailored, practical, and ongoing support 
with the goal of changing the quality of teacher-child, teacher-student interactions in the classrooms so that teachers feel supported and fulfilled in their careers and eventually learning outcomes for students also improve. And as Eze mentioned, this is a task that takes a village. This is our second baby. So we've done it once with Teach. We know that with two, it's going to be even more difficult. But thankfully, we know that there's a wealth of evidence out there. There's a wealth of experience from the field that we can build on. And the coach team, we're not going to try to reinvent the wheel. We really want to build on what already exists. So as part of this, this is why we've invited our esteemed panel of guests who all bring with them a wealth of experience and knowledge in this area. We've also got our expert moderator, Dave Evans, who is himself an expert in this field. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dave to take us through um, the panel discussion. Thank you very much. All right, thanks everybody so much for, uh, thanks everybody for, for being here. Thanks for those amazing presentations. So, you know, the, um you know, this event is billed as Innovations to Transform Teaching Practices, and we've spent the last uh, half hour talking about a number of innovations that the World Bank has been working on and how we can figure out what teachers are doing uh, more effectively, the quality of that classroom instruction, and now with work going forward, how we can expand that uh, beyond primary school and how we can change that from just, uh, you know, learning from what teachers are doing to actually supporting those teachers and helping them figure out um, how to get better. So we have a wonderful uh, group of panelists who have looked at innovation in teaching at every stage in the career, from recruitment to preparation to accountability to support um, at every level. So I'm excited to introduce uh, introduce real quick. We have uh, Matthew Kraft, who is an associate professor of education and economics at Brown University, and uh, Roshin uh, Corcoran, who's chair in education and professor at the University of uh, Nottingham, uh, Yanu Krusagwayu, who is an economist at the Inter-American Development Bank, and Yaquiba Silliers, who is at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. So what, I've, what I'd like to start out with is ask each of our panelists, as we talk about innovations to transform teaching practices, uh, what is an innovation that we're not thinking about enough? So if you, know, if you could use this little platform that you have to talk about some way that we should be innovating in how we transform teacher practices at any stage in the, in the teaching profession, which one would you kind of use this as a bullhorn to talk about? So Matthew, why don't you kick us off on that? There we go. Good morning, everyone. I think the, the innovation that has a lot of intuitive appeal but yet remains largely untapped is the knowledge that's present in every classroom across the globe. And that is that teachers bring with them different strengths and weaknesses. And we would expect that to be distributed quite broadly in the education sector and that we fail to tap that expertise. It doesn't mean that every teacher, as we've seen, scores well on all of these dimensions. In fact, just the opposite, that there's quite a range of variability within an individual teacher in their classroom practice. But it's likely that there's a teacher in most schools that does better than average on some of these dimensions captured by the teach instrument. But yet we're not turning to that teacher to figure out what they're doing that works in the specific context that we're trying to improve. And in addition to that, when we have a classroom and a school culture that shuns that, that, that has a closed door policy, a kind of individualistic, you are the expert in your, on your own island, uh, we, we kind of fail to, to tap the collective efficacy of the professionals in the building. And so I think if we would first learn about the expertise in the building through a tool like Teach, it helps to shine a light on, on the potential and then really provide the space and opportunity and context that would allow teachers to observe each other to compare their instructional practices and to build on the skills and strengths and talk about their weaknesses within 
a single school setting, we might find the expertise we've been looking for all along. So this sounds great, and I think this idea of kind of peer, you know, peer learning within schools, and I know some previous classroom observation work showed this point that in almost every school there were some teachers who were doing reasonably well. So, but just one follow up on this, which I'm curious, you know, this is something I know in, in World Bank documents I often see like, oh yeah, we gotta build communities of practice. It gets thrown around a lot because it sounds good and it sounds cheap. Um, is there a place that you feel is doing this well? Like, and kind of what it looks like in that context. So one of the truths about education systems is that this, regardless of whether or not you're in a context where it's a highly centralized uh, national structure or more like in the US where we have a very decentralized system, what happens on the ground in schools is widely variable. And so I could point to a number of um, school systems, specific districts or chartered management organizations where what they're doing is developing a culture that values open inquiry about instructional practices and a commitment to continuous improvement. And I think that's just a, been very hard to cultivate and sustain at the same time when we're trying to pair data about instructional practice with accountability. It's not that that's, they're incongruent, but that developing a place where teachers feel comfortable to admit they have both strengths and weaknesses and tackle those has not always been possible when there's a concern that by simply capturing data about their performance, it could be ultimately used against them. Mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting. So kind of building these structures that'll look different in different schools, but to foster a culture kind of of collaboration that sort of, I mean, so obviously I think everybody agrees that teachers have to have some degree of accountability, but sort of shifting a focus away from accountability, not shifting everything away from accountability, but having sort of a focus on collaboration and like you say, a, a desire to improve. Um, Roshin. Um, okay, so thank you so much for inviting me and just thank you to the World Bank. I think what you're doing here is incredibly innovative. Um, so I'm looking forward, I think we're all going to learn a lot from the work that you're taking on here. Um, so in terms of innovation, I'll speak a little bit about some of the work that my team and I have been doing around social and emotional learning. And then I am going to encourage challenge uh, the World Bank to move this work forward in a way that focuses on evidence, in a way that focuses on developing the teacher's own social and emotional competence, and also that you focus not just on in-service, but on pre-service. This has to happen much <coughs> earlier in the process. Um, so. Uh, my team and I, we recently published, it was a systematic review and a meta-analysis where we looked at universal, so these were targeting all um, students, school-based social and emotional learning programs for improving students' academic performance. And the purpose of this synth synthesis project was really to apply consistent methodological standards to the research, similar to those that have been used by the federal Watworks Clearinghouse to determine which approaches have been shown in high quality research, so randomized controlled trials or quasi-experimental designs to improve students' mathematics, reading, and or science performance. Um, that work, as I mentioned, is published in Educational Research Review. It was funded by the Jacobs Foundation. And what we found was that overall, social and emotional learning programs, they appear to be pretty promising in, in, in terms of improving students reading, math, and those smaller, in terms of effect sizes, science performance. But not all approaches worked. We found some approaches that looked to be pretty promising. Uh, 
those tended to be what we might call school-wide approaches. So they had curricula that was appropriate for the developmental levels of the child. They often had professional development for teachers and school leaders. Some of them had training and resources for parents and the administrative staff in the school. We also found some approaches that had what we might call unintended negative consequences. So there were some cell programs in large randomized controlled trials which had small negative effects on reading and mathematics. And then we found a kind of a larger set of approaches, some of which are some of the most widely used programs in the United States and in Europe. And when we reviewed the research, did not meet our inclusion criteria. Does that mean those approaches don't work? Not necessarily. But why would you use one of those over something that has been shown to be effective in high quality research? So I think what we need going forward, or at least what I would like to see, is a much greater focus on evidence, understanding what works, and programs that target not only developing students' social and emotional competence, but also focuses on the adults. And I think teachers really make a great point of insertion to begin this work going forward. Thank you very much. And I'll just, again, take advantage of the fact that I have the mic to ask one follow-up on that, which is, so there is, um, so yeah, so at this point, kind of the evidence on the value of students' social-emotional skills obviously is deeply, you know, is, is impressive. Are there any, so any approaches that have been, a f and, and, and the role of teachers in building those is also kind of well-documented. So out of this review, Kind of what would you say if someone were going to do the next experiment on how to boost teachers' socio-emotional skills to make them more effective? Like, what would you say someone at the World Bank should try? Like, okay, here's something where either it's been well shown in a high-income environment or there's some suggestive evidence. Like, what's the next thing we should try on building teachers' socio-emotional skills? Yeah, so in um, that review, there were as I mentioned, a number of approaches. Um, um, we kind of go through this in the paper. So uh, one particular approach, positive action, um, looked to be pretty effective in large randomized controlled trials. But again, that was involved in a US sample. So you're going to need to trial that and make sure, or help us understand what works under what conditions and for whom it's successful. Um, there was another approach, the Comer School Development Program, which came from Yale, which is actually a pretty older program. And I think sometimes we're attracted to the newness of something. Um, but there's something that looked to be pretty effective, particularly for students' mathematics performance. There was another program that came out of the University of Houston that looked to be pretty effective. But you know, there's no ultimate guarantees that just because something worked in New York or in California that you're going to find similar effects in low and middle income countries. Um, so I, 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 I say this with a, you really need to focus on generating that high quality evidence so that we can really understand which programs and which approaches work. Uh, the second point I'll just make is, you know, bringing this back to pre-service teacher education. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, we know teaching and learning to teach, it's complex and it's pretty stressful. It's complex and stressful because the nature of teachers' work and the contexts in which they work have and are constantly changing. And unfortunately, teacher preparation programs have not kept pace. And now there is this residing gap between what's happening in teacher preparation and the kinds of competencies that teachers need to not only be successful, but to stay in the profession. We know that teachers routinely are leaving with stress and poor emotion regulation continually ranking as some of the top reasons why they become dissatisfied and leave the professions. 
So we need to see much greater innovation, high quality evaluation during teacher preparation. And that will, I think, require you know, strong partnerships with university-based programs, teacher preparation programs, and start embedding your interventions there, thinking about teaching and learning to teach along the continuum that continue when they move into the classroom. Thank you very much. And I think uh, I would agree that one of the big gaps is in kind of pre-service and how to strengthen pre-service. And so insofar as we can build evidence on how to do that and how to strengthen these socio-emotional skills to keep teachers in the profession, to make them more effective, that's amazing. Um, Yanu, what's your innovation? OK, so first, thank you very much for the invitation to this birthday party. It's fun, and, and congratulations to the proud parents of teach and coach. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm hoping it's going to be a very long life for these um, instruments, etc. Well, uh, I have to agree with what Matthew and Racing, Racing, <laughs> Racing um, was saying. Um, and I'm going to give an example on how do you go from getting this very rigorous evidence on what works and what doesn't work in different um, contexts. So um, I'm just going to talk about one example. Um, and this was something that we have been working for nine years with the Ministry of Education in Ecuador. We went to the Ministry of Education in Ecuador about nine years ago, and the minister and in the entire community were very worried that they were not being able to actually identify more effective teachers. They just didn't know what to do. So we proposed a large randomized control experiment. We took 20,000 20, children in approximately uh, 200 schools. And this, these children were starting kindergarten. We randomized these children to their teachers. And we did this for eight years, uh, since they were in kindergarten all the way until they finished uh, elementary school. W one of the goals of this research was to actually look at what are the characteristics and what were the behaviors that teachers have that would impact learning. Um, uh, this is outcomes in math, language, and executive function that also goes to um, social emotional skills. So uh, to make this short, we actually found just two variables that would impact um, the efficacy of teachers. One was experience, and one was the measurement that was taken from an instrument of in-class observation. This was way before teach was developed, so it was nine years ago. And I wish we had had teach by then, but we used another instrument. And this instrument was basically uh, looking at, at something that we call responsive teaching. Um, we found some evidence on, on the that teachers would, would score higher scores in this instrument were more effective in terms of uh, learning outcomes. So the next step was, OK, we have this information, but now we want to expand this into policy, which is also, I, I think of that as an innovation, because it's, it's also a way in which we, we can translate this, this very high quality research to policy implications that the countries actually can use. So we developed this mentoring program. And the mentoring program was based on having these teachers improve these practices using the tool, this, this observation. And we work with a group of mentors. We work with a group of mentees. These were highly qualified mentors. And we work with these mentees for a year, an academic year. And um, they were very happy. The teachers were very happy. But this was definitely a change a, sweet, a, a change in their paradis paradigm in terms of what is it that they were originally doing in their classrooms. So we understand that this takes a lot of change from the teachers, from the community. So after the one year of the 
of the mentoring experiment, this pilot, we found positive effects on one of the dimensions of this classroom um, observation uh, instrument. And that was mainly on what we call emotional support. So teachers were highly getting higher scores on, on, on emotional support, but this was not actually translating into learning outcomes, and we feel that this is mostly because we tested the children just right after one year of the implementation of this mentoring program. So one lesson learned is we need to give these teachers ongoing support so they can actually ad administer their pra the new practices and their new concepts in the classroom for several years, having their support, ongoing support of mentors, the Ministry of Education, etc. Um, we found that teachers were were feeling very motivated because they were actually trying to help the students, and they had more uh, incentives to go in their classrooms and have these um, new ways of of interacting with the students. And we also. Um, one of our takeouts of, of this is that we also need to take more time into developing even more evidence on the things that can actually predict um, teacher efficacy, all these instruments that we want to, to use, and to gather how do we go from these tools that actually predict, predict learning outcomes into actual policy in the countries that we are working on. And that requires a lot of help and support from the ministries, the social, um, the social economic uh, population, parents, etc. That was too long, but sorry. No, no, this is great. So, I mean, as a lot of people in this room have worked a lot on sort of carefully managed randomized trials or quasi-experimental mm -hmm. evaluations, so it is truly an innovation to actually move that into move that into policy. Um, Yaquibus. Great. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I am extremely excited about what Coach is doing. Um, I'm not an innovator. I'm a researcher, so I can tell you. Um, just quickly, I think where the evidence is about what works, um, where the biggest challenge lies, uh, and then maybe what innovations could be to address that challenge. So, so one of the reasons why Coach is just spot on is, is sort of one of our big wins in education is to improve early grade reading in particular is this kind of coaching model, which is a combination of often uh, lesson plans um, and then these coaches who come to the schools on an ongoing basis um, observe teaching uh, and provide pedagogical support. And there are a lot of reasons why they highlighted. There's sort of four aspects about being practical, uh, ongoing, uh, why this works. Um, so this is great news and you know something to be excited about and this is exactly why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, the big challenge is that all attempts that to make this a scalable solution have failed, except for one example which is an outlier. Um, so I'll give you two examples. So one example is in, um, in um, I think it was in Uganda, uh, where they had sort of two versions of this kind of structured pedagogical support, but they had a lower cost version uh, which relied on uh, the government uh, to do this coaching, to provide the role of the coaches, and that failed. There was, they went from being the most effective program ever evaluated to sort of having no impact by making this one small tweak. Um, we've had a similar challenge in South Africa where we thought, okay, let's try a lower cost model where these coaches don't go uh, in person, but they provide this virtual support, and it was a really fantastic, well-designed program, thinking about how to build this relationship, and they, you know, they really had a good relationship, these virtual coaches with the teachers. That ended up having a, a positive impact at sort of basic uh, vocabulary skills. Um, it was targeted at English, but had a negative impact on, on uh, learning in the home language. Um, so often these kind of attempts to make this more scalable uh, actually aren't very successful, uh, which is exactly what Coach is trying to do now. Um, so, you know, what, what can be done? Um, you know, one potential innovation or solution uh, that I can think about is you sort of need to work within the government system, right? Uh, and so there often are government 
uh, staff, district administrators who are really playing this role as providing this mentorship and support and, and uh, uh, observing uh, teachers. Um, exactly what is being done with the teachers and providing this very structured, um, almost prescriptive, and it works in, in, in cases in, in low quality environments, a kind of coaching support, the same needs to happen with these coaches themselves who, who are playing this role. Um, and this is why I think the one example in Kenya, I said the one outlier in Kenya that Ben Piper has done with the Tsosome is where they actually did provide that very, very structured guidance and support to these coaches to the point where they also had their own lesson plans where they had videos uh, or they had like an iPad to say you should now observe X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the innovation could be, even though the technology failed us in one aspect and in many other aspects, I think the technology could be incredibly powerful in, in, in helping, motivating teachers and, and motivating uh, and monitoring, supervising these coaches to, to, to play that role. So we got to coach the coaches, so, um, <laughs> which makes absolute sense. Um, so Equipus talked Thanks about... Thanks for dubbing, my, dubbing down my, yeah, exactly. my 10 minutes. Yeah, I really the, appreciate it. I know, exactly. If you want it in three words. So, um, you know, Equibus gives an example where the technology did not, where the technology didn't help. You know, when we talk about innovations for teaching practices, a lot of times the first thing people think of is technology, like innovation. You're like, okay, is there a tablet that can solve our education problems? I hope so. If you find one, let me know. Um, but in the meantime, I know that uh, I know that Matthew has done also done some evaluation of technological approaches. Uh, I know um, uh, Roshin has done some uh, systematic review work on this topic. So what do you guys, is what's the role of technology here? So I think it's easy to fall into the allure of the new, the shiny, the um, potential that new technologies pose. And what we have to step back and fundamentally re remind ourselves that in a model where we're talking about coaching, there's almost no way to cut corners when the core feature of that model is two individuals, either virtually or in person, talking to each other about instructional practice. Now, maybe technology facilitates, and where I think it has particular potential, and which might be an area for kind of the fifth birthday of, of Teach, uh, when we're all back here in a couple years, to match grade and subject specific, specific teachers to instructional experts in those areas, mm -hmm. uh, which may not be possible in a more remote region or an area where there just isn't that type of capital available um, and expertise. I, I think a second potential is, is simply capturing uh, video of a classroom mm -hmm. and a teacher's instruction. The, Technology to do that has advanced rapidly in the last 10 years, such that the audio is really powerful, 360-degree cameras. And what that allows you to do is to talk about really specific instances of how the kind of you know, serve and valley between a teacher and student played out and what you might have done differently. And I've even seen some really innovative work speaking recent to your focus on teacher prep around um, a simulation-based uh, trial and error practice uh, platform for pre-service teachers to try an approach with a, um, a virtual group of students and that are kind of uh, semi-autonomous but with some actors helping them. And then to try that exact, you get some feedback, immediate coaching, and you get to try that exact same instructional approach five minutes later. And so you get multiple at-bats around a small instructional move. But we, we've seen in these examples that Jacquivas was talking about in, in some of my own work, a, a meta-analysis of 60 randomized controlled trials of coaching programs that, as we've talked about, taking these programs to scale is particularly challenging. And I think they often um, do not live up to expectations because we're trying to meet bottom lines and so we're trying to cut costs and what's the primary cost? It's it's salaries. It's the 
personnel you have to have to do this. And so we create groups of several teachers with one coach. Or we have coaches work with, instead of 20, 40 teachers. Or we also have a little bit of coach's time stolen to administer the high stakes exams and also fill in as a substitute teacher. And so when those things happen, uh, we get away from the core human element of this work. Thank you. And I would, uh, along the lines of what um, Roisin talked about, about building evidence, there's some nice evidence from Kenya that many of you have, will have seen by Piper and others testing different ratios of coaches to teachers because that's exactly you know it's tempting to be like well here's our budget so let's assign 50 teachers to one coach as opposed to testing and you know if we can't cover all the teachers right now with our budget you know better to to cover some of our teachers and actually make a difference than to have something that we roll out to everyone that has a zero or even a negative impact um roshin technology um, okay, so I'll just uh, speak about kind of two pieces of research that, that we've done and maybe what we've learned. Um, the first part, so prior to joining the University of Nottingham, I was at um, Johns Hopkins University, and we did a piece of research there where we were just looking at ed tech procurement. Uh, and we were looking at this in the context of the US, so again, how this would apply in other systems, we don't know. But we were just kind of interested in, you know, how does educational technology, how is it discovered? How is it acquired? Like, how does it actually get into schools and school districts? Uh, and we, you know, produced a, a pretty large 200 page report. Uh, but there was uh, one finding that I think is important here, because when we talk about this question of technology, especially in the context of teaching, I think we often get the question of, well, should we use more technology? Should we use less technology? And I'm always like, well, you should probably use what works uh, and stick to effectiveness, but also cost effectiveness, right? That piece of research where we looked at ed tech procurement, what we found was two of the most common ways in which ed tech gets into schools and school districts is one, word of mouth. So the superintendent might ask the superintendent next door, what are you using? Do you like it? Great, let's use it here. The second, which is perhaps even more worrying, uh, is vendor-driven marketing. And I'm not sure about any of you, but I've never really heard someone who's trying to t sell me something saying it's not evidence-based or <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, and, and so, you know, very often you, you will rarely see ed tech approaches and different products being tested in something like a randomized control trial or a quasi-experimental design. So, so that would be my kind of first, you know, recommendation is to focus on what works and effectiveness and also cost effectiveness. To that second point, we did um, do a large trial. This was one of the I3 validation studies where we tried to use um, virtual professional development in a large randomized control trial. And one thing I think we learned from that, that, that might be helpful as you move this work forward, when you're thinking about doing professional development and coaching virtually, you know, making sure that you know, it is evidence-based, it is embedded and connected to the goals of the approach or the program that you're trying to implement. Uh, secondly, is the cost-effectiveness piece. If you're implementing an approach with just 10 schools or 100 schools, then you know, it probably doesn't matter if you do 10 professional development sessions you know, in terms of cost-effectiveness. If you're operating with 10,000 schools across multiple countries, and if you can get the same kinds of impacts with half the dose and use technology in a way that helps you to save on time and resources and travel, then that's actually pretty important from a cost effectiveness standpoint. Um, and the third kind of lesson I would suggest is that the coaches and the people providing the professional development virtually, they matter. They must be subject matter experts. They've got to be able to provide that continuous feedback and mentoring uh, to the teachers. So the, again, to the point that was made earlier, the coaches and those providing the PD, they matter a lot.
Well, thank you. And I would just add that uh, absolutely, like cost effectiveness is essential. And as we think about costs, there is no cost effectiveness without effectiveness. And so it can be cheap, but if it doesn't work, then uh, it's not the right thing to invest in. Before I turn it over uh, for some questions, I'm going to ask one more question of our panel um, to Yanu, which is about, I, you know, I know you've done a lot of work in recent years on recruitment and how school systems select teachers. So how, how should systems be innovating in that specific regard? Um, so um, there are different levels in which we we have had some some evidence. The first thing is that uh, for children, for teachers in our in countries in the Latin America and the Caribbean, and I feel the same for other uh, middle income countries, uh, the teaching profession is not very well regarded. It's, it's not as in Korea where teachers are the stars of the system and they receive higher salaries than any other profession, etc. In terms of, of our teachers, what we have is people who go into the education field because they feel, they feel that they don't have chances in any other uh, professions. And so the very good students that could be going to um, the teaching uh, profession um, do not do not find this very attractive. Not only because of the lack of recognition of the profession, but also because of the salaries, because of the way they see that uh, career professions, uh, career progression for teachers is very um, low, it's very flat, so they don't, they don't see many incentives for this, uh, for participating and entering the, the profession. So the first thing would be um, somehow increasing the significance of this, of the teacher um, profession and get more recognition from the, the, the entire society. Um, so that, that has to do with the teachers, but it has to, with, to do with the perception of an entire society of the very important work that teachers are actually doing and how this impacts everybody, older children and young people, etc. Um, we are actually trying to, there's another, um, thing and not so an innovation that we are we we're trying to do which is um, we are trying diff in different countries and um, giving people who score high in their pre um, teaching practice in different uh, tests and different assessments and if they perform if they are higher performance in these systems so they get to choose which schools they they want to go to but there are also incentives embedded so that there's monetary incentives embedded there's money there there's recognition there's um, higher profession uh, status etc for these teachers these great teachers to start in low income communities then if they start in these in income communities they get to get all the experience in really uh, poor situations and in really challenging situations, but they get also these um, incentives. And also we are trying to have these uh, new teachers or, or people in, in pre-service, um, not, not only the content knowledge that they need to put in the, in the classrooms, but also giving them the opportunity to have, uh, to develop pedagogical practices, actual practices with groups of students that they would be able to then practice what they have learned from, from uh, the ministry and from their coaches, etc. And they are not totally surprised when they arrive to school and they're completely lost. Uh, and this has helped these these potential teachers to feel more comfortable. Of course, there's also a, lo a lot of coaching for these uh, new students or students who are uh, wanted to go into these professions. So there's a bunch of things that we can do for these young teachers or young uh, people who want to start into education. Thank you. No, that's great. An array of, of interventions. Mm -hmm. Let's take a few questions from, uh, from the audience. We'll take a, a few together, take a round. Does anybody have uh, any questions? Um, yes, well, you and then uh, you. 
Good morning. My name is Eilis Zafiraku and I am just coming from the field where we are implementing coaching with the World Bank projects in Cote d'Ivoire and Benin. Mm -hmm. So my question is related to uh, what are the drivers that will show that the teaching practices through innovation we are proposing are the right one? So meaning, are we connecting the teaching practices with learning outcomes and how. And this is what we are trying to do in these two countries where we have early grade reading programs. So in each step, the changes in the practices are completely linked with learning outcomes and what is happening at the mind of the students uh, during this process. So what are you thinking about that? Innovation for what? Innovation of teaching practices for what? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ning, and I work on uh, China and in Indonesia for the teacher professional development uh, activities. Uh, and uh, so one question that I uh, keep running into is, um, so as we discussed today, uh, the, the, uh, the feature of coaching and then, and then the mentoring, how it's a great activity, it's a great practice. Uh, I think actually in, uh, in China and Indonesia, a lot of these practices are already happening on the ground. Uh, the issue is there's no mechanism to make it sustainable or uh, there's not a very well-defined incentive system for, the, for those uh, mechanisms to continue. Uh, specifically, uh, for example, the, the, there's no, for example, there's no uh, good compensation system for, for coaches, uh, right? So, so the, a lot of them are doing it on a voluntary basis. So there's not, there's not enough incentive for them to share their knowledge or good practice. Uh, so, so I'm just trying to get uh, some insights as to whether or not it is appropriate to develop such incentive system, or what could be the the, the pitfalls for those for those incentive system. Hi, thank you very much to all the panels and, and uh, congratulations to all of the those working on Teach. Um, I have a uh, as Jaime kicked us off. He said that. When we see a, a good school, we know we have a good principal. And when we have a good classroom, then we know we have a good teacher. And I would think that that also um, you know, continues on to coaching, right? That a lot of the success of coaching is de going to depend on the quality of that coach. But um, we've had a lot of uh, difficulty, and I think Jacobus mentioned a number of examples where it's very difficult to find the sheer number of good coaches that we need to bring this to scale in any different context. Just as Jaime also said, you know, we can have a few good classrooms, we can have a few good schools because we can find or make wonderful teachers at a small scale, but how, what are the necessary characteristics of a good coach to, to bring that to and I know that coaching, uh, finding coaches is going to be different depending on different contexts. I understand that. But what kind of characteristics should we be looking for? I know um, Rosen mentioned the subject level expertise. Is this necessary for a good coach or could they be more broad generalists? And what, what other characteristics should we be looking for? Should we be looking only within the system? Should we be looking without? Um, should we be taking teachers away from classrooms? Thank you. Thank you. Um, because we're short on time, I'm actually going to allocate the the uh, the questions. Um, but okay, so I think on the first one, I think there's this question of incentives and sustainability, compensation for coaches. So in Sa the South Africa example that you've worked with, both the virtual and the face-to-face, -face, I know part of the drive for the virtual was sort of you could do more with fewer coaches. So what are some of the issues that you guys have faced and how, do you, uh, how have you overcome them? Okay, so, so I mean, there are two questions related to it. One is the incentive systems for mentoring and coaching and the other one is the characteristics of the coaches. And um, I wish I had an answer for either one of those questions. Um, I do think on, on this question of the incentive system for, for coaches, I think a mistake that governments do the whole time because it's cheap and easy it's say and 
uh, and sorry, Matthew, I think I think it's about how well it's been done. And often in developing countries, it's like, well, let's just get this one teacher to be the coach, right? And and we have a community of practice, and they can come together, and then this one teacher will do the coaching. And this person is not giving enough support. This person still has teaching duties, uh, and this person has zero incentive to actually to implement this. So that's definitely the wrong way to go with it. I, I think people need to be fully dedicated uh, to play that role. Um, I think I think that's step one. Um, I think in terms of the incentives and you know, uh, I think this has to be a program that comes from the top where the, these people are empowered to to do their role properly, and it's not just an ad hoc thing that you do sort of on the side. Um, there are many ways to try and improve incentives, even just through monitoring, having a good monitoring system in place to make sure that they are actually implementing everything they should be doing. Uh, people are also intrinsically motivated to so respond well to just being monitored appropriately uh, because they then get validated for, for the type of work that they're doing. Um, in terms of the actual characteristics of the coaches and you know how far can we go down the kind of a you know quality uh, ladder uh, I think this is all still like up for grabs uh, to know my, my instinct is my instinct is like some of these models that didn't work when they went to scale it had less to do with the the quality of the coaches but the incentive system with each, within which they were operating uh, they were often you know, government employees have a lot of other incentives and also tasks they had to do um, I do think if it's somebody who has got a dedicated role uh, who has very clear tasks that they have to implement uh, very clear outcomes that they'll be measured upon and sufficient support I do not think it would rely on just having three experts uh, to do that. Having said that, I think, you know, just drawing a distinction between two implementation models, you know, the cascade model is, you know, the most popular one. Uh, there's also the, the sort of uh, the ongoing rollout model. You know, you don't have to, like Dave said, you ha don't ha like if these have sustained impacts on, on teaching quality, you do not have to coach every single teacher in every single school in the same year. Um, you can have a couple of experts who sort of st have a staggered rollout uh, across the country. So, um, Yanu, mm -hmm. in Ecuador, how did you guys select these mentors and how did you justify taking, you know, great mentors out of their classes? Well, it was, um, we actually took teachers from their classrooms. It was uh, many stages to do this preparation for the mentors. Uh, we selected, um, this was a randomized control trial, so we selected some teachers that were deemed as high performance by, by their principals, headmasters, etc. It was, um, each principal would tell us, well, we feel that Juan or Pedro are really good, they have leadership, etc. So we brought uh, about 50 teachers for a week of, of training and assessing them in terms of not only the ability to provide support to the to other teachers uh, in very specific areas, mostly pedagogical areas, and also leadership skills, also em empathic abilities, also etc. At the end of this um, training, it actually was two weeks, not one week, we selected 10 teachers. And these 10 teachers were mentors for the entire year. So the, the, the agreement with the ministry was these teachers are, are going to be working as mentors. We want to um, produce them, change their label from teachers to mentors. Um, and then we um, selected also randomly their mentees. And we worked very closely with the mentors along the entire year. They had mentors for, we had mentors for the mentors, we would call master coders. And um, we, we got a lot of good feedback from the mentors and from the ministry and from the, the principals. Because they actually felt, uh, these mentors felt that they were being recognized just by the fact that they be, got the title of being mentors mm -hmm. was enough incentive actually mm -hmm. the, they were not asking for my money they were asking to keep on being mentors mm -hmm. and keep on learning and just staying as mentors in the system and what has happened is actually these 10 mentors are 
have stayed as mentors in Ecuador. And we are trying to produce more, uh, more of these mentors, but also thinking about which instrument to use so that we can embed in their knowledge and transmit to their mentees. Fabulous. Um, so we're just wrapping up, but I want to get two more quick answers. So, um, Roshin, you've you know made this call for evidence and you know figuring out what works, and I think this relates very closely to this question of, okay, we're improving teaching practices for what? So how can we make sure that the research we're doing is improving teaching practices towards the right objectives? And then I'll just, and then Matthew, I'd love for you to come in as a final word. You did this big systematic review on coaching. There have been a lot of questions on coaching. So a couple of final words on, uh, on what we should take away on that. Um, so I think it's going to be really important for the team as you move this work forward to clearly articulate the mechanisms, the logic model, the theory of change of how this all fits together. That will really be your kind of blueprint going forward. Doing that will help guide, you know, having a rigorous evaluation, putting a rigorous process evaluation in place so we not understand, not only understand does it work, but for whom, under what conditions, how much coaching do you need? Who needs to be the coach? What kinds of competencies do they need? And I think one way in which, I mean, when I think about this work, I think about start with the problem you're trying to solve. The World Bank have defined your problem as a global learning crisis. No, it's, it's a legitimate question as to how we think about learning. But we know there are some outcomes that most education systems care about. I've never been to a school that said, you know, we just don't care about academic achievement in this school. It's just never happened. But it's not the only outcome they care about. So if those are the outcomes, let's say, at the student level, achievement, social and emotional competencies of your students, then you're going to need to develop that in the adults, the coaches, the teachers, so that they can model and reinforce that positive behavior for students. So I think going forward, you know, a rigorous, kind of theory of change, logic model, a rigorous impact evaluation, and a process evaluation so that we can all understand what works and for whom and under what circumstances. Great, thank you. Uh, final word on coaching. So here's what I think we know from the research literature, much of which has been touched on and conducted by my esteemed uh, colleagues here. We know that general content coaching, the substance that's pr the primary focus of the teach instrument, has across international contexts, and particularly in the US, been demonstrated through rigorous randomized controlled trials to impact teachers' practice a substantial degree and substantially to translate into improvements on student performance on state standardized tests. We also encouragingly see that the greater the improvement on measures like TEACH, uh, there is at least a positive association with larger gains on student achievement, kind of validating the theory of action. We've also seen that there have been empirical studies to show that content-specific coaching is an efficacious version that builds in this pedagog con uh, pedagogical content knowledge into these general practices. Um, and is a nice complement to the types of instructional moves that we've been talking about today. The third one for which there are uh, at least two now randomized controlled trials that show the efficacy it is what I started speaking about uh, in the introductory conversation around the role of peers as coaches and the possibility of leveraging knowledge in the building. And I think there's an area uh, of further research. What we don't yet know is what makes a good coach. And this is the question we've been grappling with if you change the word coach for teacher for the last 10 years. What, how do we identify good teachers? How do we recruit them, select them, retain them? We've made progress in that realm, although there's certainly a long way to go. We are just in the nascent stages of trying to answer that question for coaches. We are also very much in the nascent stages of trying to understand how do we make coaching cost effective and maintain its efficacy at scale. 
And so that's just an area that we're going to have to experiment in different models going forward. And I think the great potential here is to, to build on some of the challenges that Yanu has discussed around changing our social and culture perception of the value of teaching is that in many contexts it's a very horizontal profession. And I think there's great opportunity to build a career ladder in the teaching profession where expert teachers have the opportunity to move into this instructional coach role, which is both brings recognition, prestige, and I would hope uh, increased compensation. And doing that will take structural changes, but it provides an avenue to build the corpse of folks we need to do this work and to potentially uh, recruit and retain the folks we most want in the classrooms today. Thank you very much. Um, just the, the final word, and thanks everyone for sticking with us. So uh, one of the things that I really take away from this is, uh, and from existing research, we cannot support students without teachers. I think it's impossible to overstate the value of what, you know, all this, you know, the, the first part of this, the teach. We cannot support teachers if we don't observe teachers and if we don't talk to teachers. It is the, it, you know, it's just, um, it seems so obvious that it's amazing how little it's been done in so many education systems. Obviously, a lot of education systems have had ad hoc ways of doing that, but a lot of education systems haven't built that in. And the last thing, you know, we've heard about a lot of different potential innovations and the opportunity to test those going forward. One of the things that, you know, I see is that, you know, structural transformational change in these education systems won't happen by accident. And so it takes clear-eyed efforts to implement and test new strategies, and we'll have to keep going forward. So with that, we'll see you all back next year at Teach's uh, second birthday. Thanks very much to Jaime, thanks to the Teach team, and thanks to our excellent panelists. <laughs>